just follow the same format and I'll try to leave enough time for questions um, at the end and some discussion. And again, if a question comes up that's very brief uh, that you'd like me to respond to right away, don't, don't hesitate, raise your hand. Um, and yes, we have uh, mics um, as well, but uh, I will uh, try to accommodate that um, as we go along. So um, returning, uh, I'd like to switch gears and talk about what I um, defined as pivot tipping points or pivot points um, for this period. Uh, what might have been the social, political, and cultural and environmental surround um, for a project uh, such as the Phoenix Hall and how that relates to the two um, uh, pa uh, patrons uh, we'll be talking about uh, today um, uh, in more detail uh, now, Michinaga and his son, uh, Yorimichi. So, Trans-regional exchange, one of the most astonishing aspects of this period, and many people who work on Japan of the Heian period sometimes don't realize this, um, but I learned about this from reading the diaries, as I said, um, of uh, these various figures, and I discovered, and then later um, a group of historians from uh, Tokyo University published um, a, a chronology of Japan's diplomatic relations. And what becomes very clear is that from the 980s, uh, but particularly after 990, there was an enormous amount of trans-regional exchange, uh, particularly with southern China, but also involving Korea um, as well. So we have a, a, a reconstruction of one of the kinds of ships that were um, taken uh, to uh, Japan from uh, the uh, continent. So basically, uh, the merchants, uh, we have their names, Zhou Wenyi, Zhou Liangshi. There are many of them. We know them by name. They appear many times in the diaries of um, the people like Michinaga. So if somebody tells you that Japan, Kyoto, uh, and Japan was isolated in this period, which is a very popular idea that sometimes goes along with the tale of Genji, don't believe them. There's a huge amount of exchange. Typical, it's no different today than we have today. So the main area was the Hangzhou, Mingzhou region, Yingbo, this area connected up with Kyushu where the major uh, harbors were. We know all the routes taken by these people um, and also to Kyoto. So there's a lot of exchange um, in this region, just bearing that in mind. Also from Bianjing or Kaifeng, the capital of the Northern Song uh, Dynasty, there were monks traveling from uh, Japan to live um, in Kaifeng, sending back all kinds of goods and letters and information. And north of that, based around Datong, uh, near uh, Wutaishan and places like that, we have the Liao or the Kitan uh, peoples of North China. So there's an enormous amount of exchange going on in this period. We know that uh, Michinaga, for instance, received uh, various writings from the Kitan people of the north um, of North China, and there was even greater exchange with um, the area throughout here, but particularly uh, with um, the monasteries of the uh, uh, Mingzhou region and also um, the trading communities that were based there. So there's a lot of um, material on this available um, these days in secondary sources. If any of you are interested, I can point you in that direction. But that's just the primary point I'm trying to make today. What came on the ships of the merchant traders and what was it that people like Michinaga and Yorimichi wanted to collect? They wanted to collect the newly edited and newly um, published in print form Buddhist Tripitaka or the Buddhist canon of which we see one example here, the Kaibao uh, canon coming produced in the 970s, printed um, and uh, uh, brought from uh, Kaifeng, brought to, um, uh, to Japan. So there's a, 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 they're very much up to date on uh, the newly translated texts and also newly compiled Buddhist canon. Um, other uh, materials that came on the left, a very famous statue um, of Shakyamuni um, in a format called the Udayana Buddha, the um, uh, magical, miracle-working Buddha that was brought from Taizhou, uh, carved in 985, brought to Japan by um, the Buddhist monk Chonen. Um, another example on the right, a statue of the Bodhisattva of Wisdom brought to Japan um, in 988 at one point. Another one was brought in 1031, brought to Japan from China, uh, probably from the southern area um, around uh, Taizhou, uh, maybe uh, from uh, possibly from Kaifeng. But anyway, this kind of material, uh, statues, paintings, uh, 
peacocks. Michinaga received uh, peacocks from uh, the merchant uh, Zhou Wenyi, brought up from uh, Kyushu and placed in Michinaga's home. Um, we'll see an example of that in a moment in Kyoto. And Michinaga in his diary wrote, writes, I don't know, they're not, having, they're not laying any eggs. What's going on? And so there's a big issue because they, they, they said, we know, we know nothing about green peacocks. These are uh, Indian peacocks. How do we deal with it? So that's just one, um, the reason I've titled my book Michinanga's Peacocks is it starts off with the, the rather funny story of Michinanga dealing with a gift of peacocks from a Chinese merchant and not knowing how to get them to reproduce. Later they do, miraculously, but there's a big hubbub over this. Um, peacock deities, a tantric deity brought um, from northern Sung, uh, a, a representation of the, the uh, peacock, um, the, the peahen queen riding on a peacock, um, a tantric deity done in um, ink and colors on silk, uh, probably brought as another gift from a Chinese merchant to Michinaga. We know he probably had it in his collection. I won't go into this, but it, it, it shows us the kind of materials that are arriving in Japan in this period when we were often told in the past there was no contact. There's a lot of contact. Um, catastrophe. Uh, we don't usually think about this, except recently with um, the Fukushima uh, event, we realize how uh, factors, random factors, can impact um, the cultural surround. So one particular problem, and it probably goes together with lots of trade uh, coming in from the continent, more maybe an uptick more than before in the earlier part of the 10th century, uh, epidemic. Um, and this is a 12th century representation from a hand scroll showing us the world of hungry ghosts, but it shows us um, a uh, burial area in the Kyoto region. Um, there were um, numerous epidemics um, in the uh, period from uh, basically um, uh, from uh, in the 995, 900 to 1100. Where's the dating for this? Okay, blue. Um, 10. I, I can't read my own chart. Um, 995 through 1030. Uh, there's an incredible uh, series of epidemiological uh, catastrophes or crises. Measles repeatedly, uh, twice in a, a population that was not immune, had not had measles before. Maybe an event in the 6th or 7th century, but not. So many, many people died. On top of that, repeated smallpox epidemics um, through the 1030s, and it just sort of stops. This is a really, really turbulent period environmentally for uh, people like Michinaga who lived through it, Yorimichi who was born during the epidemics. Um, and that's something we have to factor into some of the concerns that we will see arise um, into the early 11th century. So epidemic disease uh, mumps uh, and so on, we can uh, find all kinds of information about that in the diaries. Um, some of it is funny, they say that mumps was not so, not really uh, so serious, so they would make fun of each other. Oh, he has a big face, look at his, his jowl is enormous, etc. cetera. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, this is a period of extended um, epidemic. Uh, similar to Europe um, in the period of the Black Death. Very similar. That's later, but it's a very similar phenomenon. Um, other weird things in the skies. Um, a supernova, SN1-1006. The, the enormous, the, the biggest supernova in recorded history. Uh, so enormous that when Michinaga first saw it, he described it as a second sun, in the, in the nighttime, there are like basically two suns, two moons that appeared at night, this very bright star. And it's been reconstructed um, various places. This is from Hohokam land um, in Arizona, but 1006, a really uh, incredible and probably terrifying um, event. So that got people to think um, about the end of Buddha, the end of the Buddhist law, the eschaton. Eschatology comes from that language. Um, when according to the new Buddhist chronology that was uh, sort of circulating particularly among the Japanese and the Kitan peoples of the north, there was a very specific date when 
the Buddhist law, the final dharma, would begin. And that was, according to the Julian calendar, I looked this up, it was May 1051. So this is a specific, I don't know where the absolute chronology came from, but it was a shared chronology. That was the date that they fixed on. And so when we hear that the Buddhist, the Phoenix Hall was constructed in probably between 1050 and then dedicated in 1053, makes you wonder um, what was going on with this, this particular uh, notion. Um, there were many words used in the diaries that I've come across. They repeatedly use language like this, the end of the world. It's coming. Um, uh, mapo is another uh, term that we find. And indeed, uh, one particular document is very interesting. It precisely fixes the date, again, 1051, 1052, when the great monastery Hasidera burns down um, in Kyoto. Uh, the, uh, the diarist uh, Fujiwara Skifusa, writing in his diary, Shunki says, yeah, that's, this is proof. We have entered the decline. The end of the world is ahead of us. Now, that end of the world takes 10,000 years, so it's not exactly imminent. But they, they, they felt that that tipping point was the year 1051, 1052 in our calendar. This is consistent. It's shared <coughs> um, excuse me, by um, the, uh, the Liao, the Kitan, and the Japanese in particular, which raises questions. Why did only these two groups? The Northern Song Chinese didn't use the same... Um, uh, chronology, but they also believed that the middle of the 11th century was the end of the world, basically. Well, the end of the world would begin. Um, so, who was Michinaga? He is, um, and uh, I'll switch now to looking at the patrons and how, what their conditions were living in turbulent times and leading up to the construction of a phenomenal monument like the, Fe the Phoenix Hall. So that's the track I'm going to take. Uh, from now. So Michinaga is often described as um, the, the most brilliant uh, statesman, a Machiavellian figure uh, who dominated the court because of his wiles and so on. He rose to power uh, at the end of the 10th century and then dominated everything. Well, Machiavellian he was. He was a very smart man. He wasn't always healthy toward the end of his life, but he was very um, important. However, his rise to power is very interesting. Um, a throw of the dice, a roll of the dice, um, something out of the Mahabharata, for instance. Something changes and then you find yourself where you never expected to be. Um, in the fourth month, he was 30 years old. He uh, was just on a, he was, okay, from fourth month, 995. He's a low-ranking guy a younger son in a group of famous big brothers. He has no future at this moment. Um, a few months later, um, he is suddenly the person in charge of reading various texts and documents that have to be cleared through the royal house. That's unprecedented. You think, well, how did he end up there um, a month later? Uh, by the ninth month, he is minister of the left. He's one of the, he's really the most powerful figure in Japan at this moment, in the Japanese government. So how did this guy go from the bottom up so fast over a period of four or five months? So I don't accept the argument that he was a, a master statesman. This is impossible in this kind of Confucian realm of climbing up through the ranks and seniority in a family. He was in a, in a, not, a, not in a position. Actually, what happened was in the fourth month, smallpox peaked in the city of um, uh, Kyoto, and his older brother um, uh, succumbed uh, to smallpox, and his cousin, Naritoki, these are people who would take over. They were the head of the government. Next, in 995, many other, all of the people in the government basically lost their lives to smallpox. Michinaga was the only one left standing, basically. So he suddenly found himself in power. So his rule was really distinctive, and I think I understand why people were afraid of him, because they thought, in his own, among his colleagues, they thought he had some magical property. Um, he was certainly was very uh, uh, robust, I think, till he uh, became very ill later on in his life. He had diabetes, there was no treatment for it, and so that... Um, uh, basically ended his life prematurely, but he didn't come to power because he necessarily, he maintained power because he was very uh, smart, uh, but he came to power 
a throw of the dice, a roll of the dice, basically. So during this period, and I know someone was asking me about Fudo, um, Achala, uh, during this period, we find suddenly in Michinaga's world an interest in what are called krodas in the Sanskrit and Tibetan traditions, uh, representations, uh, emanations of Buddhas in angry format. Amida in an angry form uh, becomes this deity Fudo, holding a lasso, angry face, surrounded with light uh, and fire and so on. So this is an interesting development we find in this period, iconographically speaking. It's specifically re related to our concerns because having, we also see the appearance of a particular sculptor who produces images of Fudo, and this is um, what we were just looking at a moment ago. This area has been replaced. Here's the actual um, statue. Um, it came from the workshop of Kojo, another non-entity before this period. But it seems like many people in the studios, the workshops that served the uh, elite, um, also succumbed to smallpox. So this sculptor was able to make it. Um, and was innovative and produced, began to produce the style that we associate um, with uh, the Amida inside the Phoenix Hall um, at Byodoin. And this was the teacher and possibly the father of the sculptor of the Jocho image. But he too appeared suddenly. He rose to power because Michinaga and other contemporaries uh, liked his statue carving and he managed to get ahead um, at a time when he was originally just a peripheral sculptor working at provincial temples. So, uh, and one of the reasons he came to power was he, or came into prominence, was he produced these statues of protective deities. Fudo could help people with measles, for instance. So we're not surprised that we have lots of statues of him produced in this period. Um, also, uh, we find the first example of an attempt at this kind of wood joinery uh, technique that we see um, later with the um, Amida. So there's another uh, factor that this workshop was probably engaging in new technologies of some sort that had not been uh, typical and the window might have been opened for this, the door, the path cleared uh, because more conservative uh, workshops, more conservative artists um, perhaps lost their lives to epidemic. Japanese scholars also make the argument. I think it makes a certain amount of sense. Um, Michinaga was also, is also associated, for instance, with the Kojima mandalas, um, a rather distinctive mandala format in which the work is done in um, ink, uh, in gold and silver pigment um, on uh, twill. Uh, and that also is a very distinctive and unusual development. It's not clear where this comes from. Now, ninth century representations, such as the figure the one on the right of the diamond world, the Dainichi of the uh, cosmic, of the, the main image at Byodoin, the main uh, principal object of worship, is this Dainichi or Mahavairo Chana that I, I was talking about that, uh, about that before. Um, so this is typically the way these mandalas were constructed. Now I'm not talking about the iconography of them. I'm interested in a stylistic shift, something else. New developments occur in the arts largely, I think, through the patronage of um, Michinaga. New developments, including this very precise, uh, detailed representation um, of a, uh, the uh, Buddha um, Mahavira China or Dainichi Nyorai here. A lot of detail, almost my Japanese scholars call, it, call this annoyingly detailed. Um, and you can see the twill behind it. Just this massive attention to the surface, lavish surface. This is also something new. I'm just bringing it out to, again, make the case that a lot of imaginative, uh, I think, exploration was going on in this period. We look a little bit more closely, compared with earlier representations, the Takao uh, Buddha from a similar mandala of the ninth century. Um, this looks kind of stayed by comparison. It's all worn apart. Um, uh, worn down uh, because of usage, but you can see there's a lot more detail here, a lot of fussiness with the surface. We look even more closely. Look how carefully the artists are paying attention to the luxury and the surface uh, articulation. Now, this is distinctive. There's no other example that might help us understand, and Japanese scholars also say the same thing. It's a distinctive um, mandala format, a distinctive approach. Maybe it's related to looking at Chinese, northern Song paintings um, uh, related to sutra copying. Here's one particular example. We see some of the same 
interest in um, a lot of design uh, elements, uh, a lot of detail. Um, also in the uh, peacock image we were looking at, or the peahen um, image we were looking at a moment ago, we see the same uh, obsession with a very clean, clear uh, surface. Uh, luxury and so on. So that's, I could, uh, we can maybe talk about this later, but this is just, these are just a few of the factors associated with the period and the patronage of this person, um, Michinaga. He was also he engaged in kind of um, astonishing uh, acts of um, uh, uh, Buddhist ritual and Buddhist devotion. He buried uh, a series of um, transcriptions in gold, on uh, indigo dyed papers uh, of sutras in a canister um, on a mountain near Nara to await the coming of the future Buddha, planning, I guess, in 1007 already for the end of uh, the, the Buddhist Dharma or the eschaton. So thinking ahead, but what's interesting about this is he claims, he defines himself as belonging to the great world of Buddhism, not just Japan. He says, I am from Japan, I'm the left minister but I live, I belong, I am Japan in the, the world, the Buddhist world of Jambudvipa. This is the Buddhist cosmos, or the Buddhist, Buddhist co continent. So he counts himself as belonging to a much larger world than just Kyoto. Uh, and that'll help us understand in a moment um, the nature of the Phoenix Hall uh, as we wind up. Also very interesting, here's a section of his diary. What I'm going to point to is something fascinating. You see up here? Uh, these, these are entries, so here's a character that means uh, sun, so Sunday. Next, Monday. Next, Tuesday. Wednesday, it goes on. He used the seven day week uh, and it's identified as such in the characters and so he has also a continental orientation. I'm not sure where this comes from um, up here, another word, a Sogdian term, me, which also means Sunday, holy day. So when I brought this up, I gave a lecture on this at the University of London, and the astronomers were very interested in this, and also calendrists, because it points to a shared knowledge of the seven-day week. And so I went online and checked, is this really Sunday of such and such a date? Um, yes, it is. You could, there's an online uh, system that you can convert dates. So he was correct. This date was a Tuesday, this was a Monday, and so on. It's accurate. So that's a big puzzle. How did Michinaga have access to this kind of information? So that, again, places us in a much broader context to think about um, the Phoenix Hall. Uh, other things that Michinaga was up to, here's his um, temple, and next to it, his um, home in, this, uh, in the city of Kyoto, in this model. He built a magnificent temple uh, beginning in 1019, just around the time he was losing his sight and he was very ill. Nonetheless, he went forward with this project and he lived um, over here. Here's the structure, filled, it's called Hojoji. Filled, huge, enormous buildings, nothing like this stood in Kyoto, almost Im unimaginable. If any of you have been to the Great Buddha Hall in Nara, these are bigger than the, big, the Buddha Hall filled with hundreds of colossal statues, just uh, 197 feet across, uh, built around a, uh, a lake or a pond with an island at the middle, but this one was the Amida Hall. This is the first structure built, filled with uh, colossal images, at least 16 feet in height. So where's this sort of monumental, this gigantism coming from as well? That's a question to be asked. Today there's a, a temple near Nara called uh, Jorudiji, where you, if you can go on in the inside, if you enter it, it has a, a group of these nine or ten statues of Amida um, in this uh, iconography of the uh, various levels of rebirth in the uh, realm of Amida. This is probably modeled on uh, one of the structures um, at uh, Hojoji. So this was um, a, a kind of pivot point as well, because afterward these kinds of structures were being built. <coughs> I'm sorry. But my larger point is, where did this idea come from? There's nothing like this. Um, possibly uh, from the Liao uh, builders of the Liao dynasty. Enormous halls of this sort were constructed uh, in the early 11th century, contemporary to Michinaga, 
maybe he got some ideas uh, from them. Um, here's a, a, another version of this hall um, at Fungwell so show, showing my um, colleague Francois Louis walking along the side of it. You can see the scale. The buildings in Kyoto were the same size that Hojoji, uh, that Michinaga built at Hojoji. It was un unheard of. So uh, interior of this uh, building, the Dashiangbo Diang at the main hall at uh, Fungwell so a bunch of huge statues. And the pillars have been removed so you can see them clearly. Uh, my colleague Nancy Steinhardt has done a lot of work on this and talks again um, about the architectural adventure that went into building uh, structures such as this. So there's a possibility. So, so we've had a look at, Yori, at Michinaga. He's uh, a patron interested in new directions, new styles. He's interested in the continent. He understands himself to belong to a kind of Buddhist ecumen that covers many cultures. So what about his son, Yorimichi? Yorimichi was a kind of eccentric figure, I would argue. Um, and he didn't do so well in government. He was a more, uh, I think, aesthetically oriented uh, person. And so he spent a lot of time at his villas, and particularly um, in Uji. Um, his most famous uh, development, as we understand it, is his construction of um, a mansion in Kyoto that was astonished people. Um, it was called Kaya Noin, um, and there's an uh, aerial view of it, and there's a famous um, section of it in a hand scroll dating to it much later, 14th century, but it shows um, a bunch of visitors coming to Kaya Noin, where Yorimichi used to hold uh, poetry competitions. Sometimes the poem competitions uh, were held in conjunction with Buddhist um, rituals and practices of chanting sutras. So he, he established this format early on. Um, and he, uh, this was poem competitions largely for the type of poetry called waka, W-A-K-A. -A. I mentioned that earlier. The poems are initially sung out um, and then transcribed. Um, what was especially um, interesting about this was that um, it, this structure had many anomalous features that enraged some of his colleagues. They thought he was wasting a lot of um, resources on building a giant lake, on this hall, a pavilion, standing on an island in the lake, and he built these huge t turrets at the, at the uh, gates to his complex, red buildings. So there, there's some complaints about that in contemporary sources. So he seems to have been, in addition to a person interested in poetry, I understand he wasn't a very good poet, but he liked to get poet, poets together uh, and collect their works. Um, that aside from his sort of literary pursuits, he uh, was interested in um, kind of interesting and new architectural developments. Um, that'll become relevant in a moment. And he also promoted a kind of um, poetic practice in which uh, screen paintings, such as this one, a landscape screen from uh, it's now at the temple, well, originally at the temple Toji in Kyoto, now it's, I think it's in the Kyoto National Museum, um, shows us a scene uh, quite similar. Uh, it's a folding screen, um, uh, in colors on silk. It looks quite similar to the landscape that we see um, in the uh, Byodoin Phoenix Hall um, in particular. And there's a, a particular scene at the center. This is possibly uh, a Chinese poet uh, by Zhu Yi or Bo Zhu Yi um, telling us also of interest in uh, China-related uh, features um, as well. So this is kind of gives us a sense of what Yorimichi is up to. So um, to keep it brief, we know that Yorimichi followed after his father. His father was more dynamic and so on, but Yorimichi pulled off, I think, the more extravagant architectural adventures of which um, the Phoenix Hall, I think, um, is a particularly good example. So we'll spend um, the remaining time going back over what I think the cross currents are, what makes the Yorimichi's Phoenix Hall understood in context something even more interesting than the the wonderful structure it always is, it already is from the Japanese perspective, so cross currents. Um, the Phoenix Hall as we see it, what, where did this format come from? Let's just reiterate, where do we get this idea of the uh, central pavilion and then these wings to each side? It's a very distinctive structure. Um, and I'd like to think about where that distinction comes from and what might explain the sort of sloppiness with which it was put together, actually, the seeming haste, uh, perhaps relating to its period of construction. 
But we also have to bear in mind that among the various uh, materials being carried over to uh, Kyoto by Chinese merchants like Zhou Liangshi and others into the hands of Michinaga and Yorimichi um, were probably uh, drawings and representations of um, uh, Buddhist architecture in China, both Northern Sung um, and also uh, from the Liao dynasty. Uh, there were paintings brought over. Um, also, there's a whole variety of uh, possibilities here uh, to consider. There were also the oral reports of uh, Japanese monks coming back from uh, long extended stays in Kaifeng, the northern Sung capital, who might have gone all the way up into Liao territories, possibly, um, and were also familiar with the architecture around Mingzhou as well. So um, there are possibilities. So one possibility for the format of the, um, the Phoenix Hall, and Nancy Steinhardt has pointed out, you know, there are some structures that are contemporaneous that have this, this rather oddball um, articulation. Um, a building with pavilions to each side. This isn't exactly uh, the same plan, but we have the same arrangement of uh, roof structures to the exterior. Um, and what makes this interesting is that it is um, often represented in paintings. And this is a, a particularly famous work, The Watermill of the uh, uh, 970s or so. My colleague He Ping Liu has written um, considerably on this. But the architectural format, again, is quite similar to some of the approaches we might consider for the Phoenix Hall. Now, I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but I'm raising the possibility that a painting like this might have made its way uh, to Japan and inspired some architects, and Yonimichi in particular, uh, to build something new and radical. Um, we also know that in the Kitan areas, there is a lot of architectural adventure, um, as Nancy Steinhardt has pointed out so well in her work on Liao architecture and so on. They did a lot of things like eliminating the pillars, having huge eaves. The buildings were sometimes very unstable, and they had to do have all kinds of machinations to keep the structure standing. Um, and to resist the, the forces of gravity. So there's a possibility that there was also some knowledge of adventure um, uh, in architecture on the continent in a period when we know there was a lot of exchange. So this is just possibilities for understanding um, the Phoenix Hall. And plus, in many Liao buildings, but this is also apparently characteristic of northern Song Chinese buildings as well, we have a lot of these, they're called flying pavilions. They look a lot like the Phoenix Hall. Um, structures that are understood as the realms of the gods or places where a flying pavilion, where celestials exist and so on. These aren't very large. They can be about this size, I'm, uh, 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 the width um, that I'm showing here. They could easily, if you could bring a statue to Japan, you could probably bring a facsimile of what was called small-scale carpentry. So it's possible that this was another kind of continental or trans-regional um, interest in this kind of architecture um, at this period, the, uh, the pavilion uh, in particular. And what about all the other features inside this hall? How about the, uh, the uh, carvings of the bodhisattvas uh, or celestials with their musical instruments up surrounding the figure on all sides? We find them, uh, and the style of it as well, quite similar to Kitan or Liao um, architecture to some degree, especially this zone. They seem strikingly similar. This is a, a statue dating to uh, the early 11th century um, uh, at Datong, at a, a monastery called Sha Huayansu. Um, very similar. Um, they're not exactly the same, but there seems to be some parallel in style. Um, the statue, uh, of, I meant to go on to the uh, bodhisattva figures up at the top, um, we find those also on many Kitan uh, structures of pagodas, lots of them, flying all around. They're actually very humorous looking. They're shallow carvings uh, relating to a Buddha. Um, here we find them as well, flying upside down, flying backwards in clouds and so on. Style is different, but I think the conception may be very similar. So that's what I'm um, thinking about in terms of cross currents. And what about the paintings um, around the, sta the statue itself, the paintings um, on the walls around it? That's a fascinating issue that Ariga Yoshitaka discovered, that actually they're very similar to uh, the paintings on the interior of Liao or Kitan tombs. Um, in uh, what's now Inner Mongolia, as I've pointed out here, uh, the uh, tomb of Liao Shengzong um, of 1031, 
has this arrangement. Here's an old picture of it. Not exactly the same, but the concept is very similar. Um, seasonal imagery. And that's what makes it kind of interesting because we know that at the uh, Phoenix Hall, restorers discovered um, that on the backs of the doors are labels identifying them by season. And so that also links up with poetry and it links up with this particular view. Uh, these are shots from uh, an article by uh, Ariga Yoshitaka. I think it's uh, fascinating that this particular site in all of its uniqueness as a Japanese monument also relates in profound ways, I think, to continental culture in this period. I'm not saying that the uh, rendering of paintings and a local scenery um, around a Buddha image in Uji in Kyoto is the same thing as in a Liao tomb um, in North China, but I am saying that there must be some kind of connection that informs both. Um, and that's the project that I'm involved with in writing my book, which touches on many of the issues that we've raised today. So to close and to leave us some time for a discussion, um, I'd also like to think about um, the Phoenix Hall as a kind of a soundscape. I was just talking to someone a moment ago um, about this. What do I mean? Well, we know that this Buddha um, uh, basically is uh, kind of uh, approached and also summoned through sound to the sound of the human voice chanting the nembutsu, namu amida butsu, namu amida butsu. Um, there are also the dharani um, on the interior um, that uh, tell us something more about it. So in thinking about this Buddha, a, a particularly important element, I think a hint as to what's going on is what remains of the painting on the back of the, behind the statue on the, what's called the Rerodos. Um, and over here, there's a representation of what might be the Phoenix Hall, what might be a vision of the palace of the land of bliss. We're not sure what it is, but it's kind of in a secret spot in the building. Um, it would be behind the Buddha as we approach. But it tells us about a kind of visualization um, a kind of dream image, perhaps, that uh, in the broader context, perhaps, was intended to be summoned and experienced through sound, through the chanting of the nembutsu. Um, uh, we also know that it's a visualization process that occurs through chanting, chanting and chanting through uh, a series of 16 visualizations eventually yields a view and the personal experience of this Buddha in his landscape. So that's one way to think about it, a pure land iconography. Also to go back to what I was saying earlier, the uh, moon disk, now the moon disk is interesting, it's called a gachirin, it's a circle like this, and it is used in various meditational practices in tantric traditions, esoteric Buddhism, it's used to project one's mind and then summon the deity from within it. So on the for surface of the moon disk, we have a series of spells that summon the deity. So Amida is being called into the space as well. And it seems to me that given this idea that it's not only a discussion about a visualization of a distant pure land, that Buddha is being called down into the Phoenix Hall, um, perhaps to be there at the moment when Yorimichi and his family are chanting to have the experience but remembering that we have chanting going on and not just visualization. It's a soundscape, um, as I'll argue in a moment. Um, that also happens um, because, as we know, the, po the landscape scenes themselves have references to waka, to poetry, that's sung out and chanted as part of this. Now, uh, knowing uh, Yorimichi's patterns as a, um, a patron, he liked to bring people together for Buddhist sutra, recitation, but also for poetry meetings at the same time. They would have lectures on a sutra, they would chant, and then they would compose poetry, and then the better poems would be read out um, in, at, the, at um, Kaya Nuin, and probably, um, I would argue, they were done, that was part of the format here. So we're not surprised to see connections with the landscape around um, Uji, deer, uh, horses in the fields of Uji, at, um, in early spring appears in poetry about Uji. So the, the site involves pure land imagery, it involves tantric imagery, and also 
local uh, ideas and notions. So when we're thinking about all the things that come together in making um, the Phoenix Hall the interesting site it is, we should think much more broadly than simply that it is a, a pure land monument representing a Japanese aesthetic in this period. I think the activities of the patrons, uh, Michinaga and Yorimichi, tell us it has, it's much greater um, in its scope as a world monument that makes a difference in our understanding of the relationship between religious art, Buddhist practices, and the cultural surround. Um, and I think maybe that's something that uh, uh, Yorimichi uh, was after when he constructed this site um, in a landscape that I think he understood to be perhaps a native sacred landscape as well, and that's why there was such um, amount of um, uh, effort made in constructing it exactly where it was, and that it was built up, and then perhaps intended eventually to disintegrate and merge back into its landscape. So this is the point that I'll leave you with, and it's a big question, someone raised it with me earlier, but my students have asked the same question. Maybe this building that generations have attempted to keep standing was not meant to last. It was the Buddhist, the end of the world. No one expected that it would still be standing in the 21st century. Thank you. <laughs>